Y'all hear me? Yep. All right, let's all stand to our feet. Grab our hymn books out. We'll all turn to page number 23. Page number 23 in your hymn book. To God be the glory. Let's see it out together this evening on the first verse. Let's see it out strong together. To God be the glory. Great be So do continue to pray for that. Pray God would stir there. Do remember him Saturday night. He'll be away preaching as well. So please be much in prayer for him. That's a big youth meeting. Pray that and get kids fired up going back to school. Uh, we'll take a few prayer requests here in just a short little bit. Well, let's pray to open the service. It's good to see you at the house of God this evening. Brother Russell, would you open us in prayer? Father, we love you. God, we pray. Hey. We glorify you. We love you because you are who you are. We thank you, God, for letting us be back in church tonight.
right, don't be seated yet. We're going to keep you up all evening. <laughs> Amen. While you're up, we're going to go ahead and get our ushers to come. Uh, Dr. Calder used to say, while you're standing, you can still get to your wallet easier. Um, Dr. Calder often said, we worship God with three books. He said, we worship God with the book. We worship God with the hymn book. And you worship God with the pocket book. Yeah. So, of course, all of the Wednesday night offerings, everything that goes in goes to the youth ministry. Uh, you got Brother Kimber pushing kids forward, forward, forward. At least we can do spunting. Amen. Amen. Um, so you do be much in prayer for that. Uh, Miss Amy's going to play. You can be seated. Uh, we'll give you a chance while while you were standing to dig a little bit. So all right, you men. <laughs> Marquise was asking me, we were talking, we knew something was Saturday and I couldn't remember what it was, so I'm going to let Brother Kimber come make some special announcements. Amen. So Saturday, this Saturday, which Saturday? Yeah. This Saturday, August the 12th, we're headed down to uh, Gateway Baptist. Our pastor will be uh, preaching a youth rally down there, and we're going to be leaving here at 2 o'clock sharp. We're going to be taking the big charter bus down there, so we're going to have a nice, comfortable ride. Brother Sellers is going to be driving for us. Uh, they usually have some food for us afterwards, um, but we usually do something a little special as well. So make sure your name gets on the sign-up sheet. I think we've got about 15, if I'm not mistaken, that's on the sign-up sheet already. Just make sure you get your name on there. If you run out of room, take it off, flip it over on the back, and keep on signing. We want to take a crowd down there. Amen. So we're looking forward to that. So this Saturday at 2 o'clock we'll be leaving. Also, there's a sign-up sheet on the back for September the 9th, which is going to be our back-to-school bash. Uh, that's going to be for the juniors as well as the teenagers. Make sure you get your name on the list. 3 o'clock will be the juniors from 3 to 5. And then from 5 o'clock on, probably till about 9 o'clock, we'll have our teenage service as well. And I'll take a moment real quick just to say thank you for, for everyone that has uh, given uh, for our baby during the baby shower, all the wonderful gifts that we received, uh, all the prayers that's been uh, given. Uh, Brady uh, came into the world on uh, Saturday night at 9 o'clock. This old boy is very, very tired. He is very demanding, but he is doing good. Keep praying for Cassie and for Brady, and um, just thank you for all everybody's done. We have some food in the back, and thank you for uh, for those that prepared that and bring that to church. We'll put it to good use, but can't thank you enough for what everybody's done, uh, everybody reaching out, and uh, so he'll be here uh, Sunday morning. And uh, so we have a, a look but no touch policy that we'll be initiating for Brady. And, um, but we're excited for everybody to get to meet him. Seven pounds, six ounces, six ounces 19 and three quarter inches long. And uh, he's doing good and, and mom's doing good. So y'all keep praying for us. We love you guys and thank you for everything everybody's done. Thanks, hey. All right, as many people at Calvary are sick right now, please don't touch, amen. Uh, Brother Kimber, I love Brother Kimber. Brother Kimber is a very forgiving guy. Do y'all know that? I don't know if y'all know this, but Miss Robin Sellers had made him a peach pie one time and made somebody else a, a strawberry pie. And she sent the strawberry pie home, and Brother Kimber laid out of church that day. Uh, actually, he was way preaching. And Miss Sellers gave the peach pie away with the strawberry pie. 
and somebody took a video eating both pies and sent it to him. I'm not going to tell you who that somebody was, but Brother Kimber's a very forgiving person. And he was preaching one night. I said, well, you preaching tonight? I said, I'm leaving. So, uh, But he's a good brother. Y'all get your young people around everything you can. Amen. Just keep them around. Amen. Keep them around the preaching. Keep them around the fun stuff. That's how you build fellowship in the youth group. You're spending time with each other. So, a couple other announcements we've got to mention. Don't forget, do be much in prayer for the weekly bus promotion. Uh, it's on a uh, fresh start. So, do pray for that. Do be much in prayer for the bus routes. We want to see them grow. Summer's a tough time to grow a bus route. People are sick. People are vacationing. People are at family. People, so, it's a hard time to get kids in the, in the groove. But do be much in prayer. Our bus workers are beating the paths, but they just got to get to the right doors until God right. sends them. So, y'all be much in prayer for them. Brother Crabtree's got August 19th, 630, is the Film Fellowship, God's Compass. So, do be here for that. Do, I think there's a sign up you can sign up for on that. And then August the 27th, that Sunday, is Homecoming with a 50s theme. So get your poodle skirts and all that. One year I came in a t-shirt and I told the preacher I rolled me up a New Testament in my sleeve. I said, well, I didn't bring cigarettes, preacher. So, um, but do dress up for that. That's a good time. We also, August 21st through the 25th is Revival with Brother Mark Stroud. If you were here last time he was here, he was a tremendous help to the church. It's almost as if he had a playbook and a history of everything that had happened in the church in the past year. And it, it, God just had him right on on target. I remember the preacher looking at me once like, how in the world is he? We knew, he knew how he was doing it, but how is he doing this? So he's a great, great preacher. I promise you will not be bored with Brother Mark Stroud. He will help you. So be here. I heard Dr. Ronnie Simpson say one time, he said, guess who's going to be here every night of revival? And this is what he told on a Monday night of a revival. He said, the devil. He said, so if you don't come every night, you're sorrier than the devil. Now, Dr. Simpson said that. I didn't say that. Dr. Simpson said that. But uh, and there's also a nursery sign-up sheet. So if you, want, if you can help out there, uh, do sign up for that. So that's us back there as well. So we'll take a few prayer requests this evening. Uh, do, do remember the preacher as he's out of town. Do be much in prayer for him uh, as he preaches. Of course, remember uh, the crab treats as they're traveling. Uh, several others that are sick. Please remember them. Uh, we'll start over here on this side. Somebody with a spoken request you want to mention this evening. Yes, ma'am. Miss Sam. Amen. Do remember that special request. God knows the need. Yes, ma'am. I have a phrase. I talked with Jennifer Tucker today. Milton went to the doctor, and um, actually, they were very encouraged. The thoughts mm -hmm. in his lungs were decreased, and they, they're really struggling. And this is exact. God knew exactly what they needed. Amen. So they were very encouraged. Amen. Praise the Lord for what's going on. Amen. Y'all do be much in prayer for Milton. He's battling cancer. They're just good people. Just just, just wonderful people. Y'all do pray. Thank you for sharing that. Amen. Yes, sir. Um, I have a praise as well. My friend uh, Joshua in India, who has a ministry over there at the orphanage, he, they've been struggling for a long time to raise enough money to finish their building. The government put pressure on them. They had to get it done quick. Amen. Amen. What a blessing. Do pray, boy. India can be a tough part of the world right now. So yeah. What a blessing. Amen. All right. Yes, ma'am. I have an unspoken request. Amen. Amen. Do you remember Ms. Cochran's unspoken? All right. Here in this section. Yes, sir. Brother Kerry. Uh, protection for our country. Amen. Amen. I'm not a big news watcher, but I know it. our world's a mess. So. Yeah. If you don't know our government's a mess, you have not paid attention at all. I don't care which side of the aisle you're on. So, amen. Do pray for our nation. Yes, ma'am. Um, pray for my dad. He's not doing well at all. We went home this Saturday. He's walking from the door to Walmart to inside the city out of sick and breath. Would you pray for him and Shelly and Ronaldo? Amen. Sure will. Do remember Shelly's father and uncle. God knows those needs. Brother George. Amen. Amen. Do pray for Brother George at the, at the workplace. Help him stand for the Lord and stand right. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. Pray God get in the courtroom. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Carol. Hey. 
Amen. Amen. Don't you love the stories when the doctors just can't explain it? Right. Amen. I can explain it. Amen. 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 Anybody else? All right. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. Miss Wendy's unspoken. All right. Here's Miss Section. Yes, ma'am. That's right. Amen. Do pray for her. Amen. You got a lot of sisters. No, I'm kidding. Um, so <laughs> do pray there. Uh, Brother Zittle's daughter and son-in-law are looking to move this way, and it looks like that'll happen, so y'all do pray for them. Uh, just God work out the way he would want to work it out. So just remember that. Do pray for them. They've been here a lot visiting with us, so uh, do continue to pray for them. I know Grandma and Grandpa want those grandbabies close. So. Right. All right. Let me say, Brother John. Pray for our school kids going back. Pray they'd be a beacon and a shining light. They can do it. God can use yeah, them. God. So, Amen. Uh, boy, it sure is easier if somebody's praying for them. Amen. Yeah, Thank you, Brother John. Anybody else? All right. Yes, ma'am, Miss Joyce. Pray for Miss Whitney uh, and Marty. Uh, send any encouragement, Brother Barry Spears. I heard him preach the other week in his testimony. He said he woke up in of all places. He was in a bar floor quoting Psalm one. God right. never let him forget what God what was instilled early on. So uh, y'all do pray those verses to just start coming back up. So do remember that. All right, here on this side. All right, yes, yes sir. for the Johnson family, sure will. Yes, ma'am. Y'all do pray for Bill. They've, they've asked prayer for him a long time.
pray for Miss Linda. Pray, uh, God, just help her. Victory. Just get victory. And pray for those. Pray for those boys. Yes, yes sir. Amen. Pray for Nairik's nephew. Yes, sir. But just don't pray. I'm having we had a revival in prison. Me and the Rogers, Rock Lee's team will be coming. The end of September, we're doing a big outreach for the staff of the prison. There's almost 600 employees there, and I've been burdened all year. God's given me liberty to, to plan some things. At the end of September, big push to try to reach the staff of the gospel. So you pray, and, uh, I can plan, I can strategize, but without the power of God, I might as well just stay at the house. Amen. 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 But y'all pray about these things, revival, the end of August, and then the staff outreach, the end of September. Amen. Amen. Y'all pray, if you never, I've been blessed to go a couple times in prison ministry, it's a dark place. Pray for the revival for the inmates and imagine working around that every day, day in, day out. So you pray for the staff. Lots of them saved. And a lot of them just need to be saved. So y'all pray for that. Sure will. Yes, ma'am. It's easy to not remember them, but do, do pray for Mr. Linda. <coughs> yes, sir, brother. Hey, brother Justin, y'all remember me? Lord, you keep filling the calendar up. And also next week, Macy starts college. Pray for her. Amen. Amen. I still remember when she was little bitty, so that's hard to believe. But y'all pray. Brother Harry's been staying really busy. Amen. So Amen. we pray for him. All right. Yes, sir, brother Justin. Doug's uncle. All right. Brother Kimber, if you'll come pray for us, and then we'll have a song. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, we just want to thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here tonight, God. We thank you for joining us together. For those that have come out tonight, God, we thank you for those prayer requests that have been mentioned by an uplifted hand. God, I pray that you just touch those, Lord, that are in need of your touch and comfort. God, that healing touch, God, I pray for those that have mentioned salvation. God, I'm just so thankful, Lord, for a people that have a burden for those that are lost. And God, Lord, I pray that each of us carry that burden. God, I pray that we just be the light and the salt that you've called us to be. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you give us an opportunity, God, to be able to present the gospel, Lord, to somebody. And God, Lord, that we do it with joy inside of our hearts. God, that people can see a difference inside of us. And God, Lord, that we just live a life that's pleasing, Lord, that, can, that they can tell a difference, Lord, of who we are, Lord, that we are a separated people. And God, I pray that you just be with those, Lord, in our church that are recovering. God, I still think about Brother Bud, Lord, for Brother Mike, Lord Patrick. God, I pray that you just touch him, Brother Johnny. God, I'm so thankful that he's here. But God, I pray you continue to touch him, Lord. And I know that he's still dealing with pain. God, I pray that you just continue to move upon those that aren't here, Lord. There's so many families that are sick. God, so many families, Lord, that are traveling. God, I pray that you just give them traveling grace. Lord, I thank for Brother Russell, Lord, and his burden and passion. Lord, for the prison ministry, God, Lord, I pray that you just be with their revival. God, I pray that you just be with that staff meeting that's coming up. God, I pray that you just give him exactly what he needs, God, to be able to orchestrate and moderate that service. But, God, Lord, I pray that you just show up and show out. And, God, that you just do things that only you can do. God, I pray for Brother Harry that you continue to touch him, Lord. God, I pray you continue to fill that calendar up. Yeah. Use him in a mighty way, Lord, to be able to bring honor and glory to your name. God, I pray that you just continue to touch our pastor this week while he's in Wilson. Give him traveling grace on the way home. I pray that you just meet the need of that service this week. God, I pray, Lord, that you just do uh, just wonderful things there, God. Lord, I pray that you're exalted and lifted up. And God, Lord, I pray that we as a people, God, that we not, Lord, hinder the, the momentum that our young people have, Lord, that come back on fire from camps. God, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for the services that we've had. 
services that we've had at camp. <coughs> God, I pray that we not put a damper on it, God, Lord, that we just exalt your holy name. God, that we really reflect, God, on who you are, Lord, and who we are. God, what you've done for us, God, all that you endure. Amen. God, I pray, Lord, that we just get ourselves in check, Lord, that we just really seek after you. Yes, Revival, yes. God, I pray, Lord, yes. that we just take the old bitterness that's in our heart, Lord, over Amen. little bitty things that are said, a little bitty things that are done. And God, Lord, that we be a people that are united together, Lord, here in Calvary, yes. Lord. Amen. Amen. Behind our pasture, God. Yes. Lord, just encourage him, God, just to be able to be obedient and faithful, yes, Lord, God, to the things, Lord, that you give him the vision that we're in need of. Yeah. God, I pray that we just do wonderful things here. Lord, in Statesville, North Carolina, God, I pray that this revival Amen. just spark us. And God, that you just get magnified and glorified, Lord, for everything that's done. God, I just want to thank you, Lord, that we can reflect, Lord, on what it means to be justified. Lord, to have the liberties and freedoms Amen. that we have to be able to praise and worship you. God, you are a holy God, Lord, Amen. and I pray that we reverence you as that. God, Lord, I plead the blood over this place tonight. God, I pray that we just lay aside our pride, Lord. I pray that we lay aside the carnalities of this old Amen. world. God, I pray, Lord, that we just really reflect on what we're here for. God, I pray that you just touch Brother Woolwich, God. Amen. Thank you for how you've used him over the last few weeks. God, I pray, Lord, that you just be with him. God, I pray, Lord, that we just get ready to praise and worship you tonight because it is you and you alone who is worthy. Amen. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, for first loving us. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. something on him, but God never gave me peace, so I want to go back to this fella, uh, look at uh, one of the most interesting characters in the book of Judges, almost a fifth of the book of Judges surrounds the life of this man, 
One chapter deals with his birth, and then after that, you see three chapters dealing with his life. This is one of those people, I think a lot of people, you learn about him as a kid, but I think a lot of people can understand him because in a lot of ways, we're a lot like this man. Uh, stand with me if you're able, Judges chapter 13. I'm not going to read a great length of, of scripture. I would love to, but do keep your Bible open. We're going to look at some passages, and I want you to see them for yourself. Uh, Judges chapter number 13 says in verse number 1, Judges 13 verse 1, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. I'm going to give you the story of the book of Judges. The children of Israel would be living for the Lord, and then they would turn into sin, and they would fall into captivity. And then they would finally get right with God and say, God, we need help. And God would send a judge and he would deliver them. And then the judge would die yeah. and they would fall back into sin. So the story of the book of judge, Judges is like a roller coaster, up yeah. and down, up and down. You ever felt like your Christian life's like that? Up and down. That's the life of Samson in many ways. But that's what's going on here in verse 13 or chapter 13. Look at verse 2. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and bare not. Here's one of those ladies in the scripture like Hannah that could not have a child like Rachel. And when God sent one, God sent a special one. Look what happens. It says in verse 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou, uh, behold, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Say, who is her son? Look over in verse 24, the Bible says, And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshdeol. Now what happens in this passage? You see a lady and her husband Manoah are unable to have a child. And they've been desiring a child, and God sends them a child. Not out of any unusual fashion like Mary, but God just decided to give them a child. And when God gave them a child, he gave them a son that would become one of the great judges in the book of Judges, rule over and attack and cause problems for the Philistines. The problem was Samson left a lot on the table. He left a lot on the field. He didn't do what he could have done. Samson didn't live up to his potential. And I want to preach tonight on this thought, the tragedy of wasted potential. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us this evening. God, I pray that you would help us to, to have brevity as you would see fit. God, I pray that you'd help us to say exactly what you would will us to and nothing that we shouldn't. God, I pray that you'd protect my mind and my tongue. Help me just to be a help to the church. God, prepare our hearts. God, for the days ahead, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You can be seated this evening. Now, I told the preacher, I said, I'm not, I won't preach as long as it did at the tent meeting. He said, oh, I don't care. I won't be there. But I won't do that to you. Um, he said, go long as you want, but I won't do that to you. I, I didn't even look at my watch at the tent meeting. I will try to do that here. Samson was a young man. When he was born, he had everything heading the right direction at the time of his birth. Say, how so? He had parents that are trusting in the Lord when nobody else hardly in the whole nation of Israel is trusting in the Lord. He had parents that stood out from anybody else. Well, if you were raised under a set of parents that kept you around the things of God, you ought to praise the Lord. But he was, and then it says in uh, verse number 24, it said in the latter part, and the Lord blessed him. Boy, could every American not say that? The Lord bless him. Amen. Do you realize, I was listening to an old message. Natalie and I were coming back from Brother Dalton's church late Sunday evening a couple weeks ago. We were listening to Brother Matt Allen when he preached here. We was listening to him coming down the road. And he quoted some statistics on how the absolute poorest people in the United States who work no job and get all government substance and all government funding are richer than the greatest majority of this world. Right. Well, that changes perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. You can not even work in America and be richer than a large portion of the world. We are blessed yeah. abundantly yeah. Right. in the United States. Not only that, he was separated from his birth. He had a Nazarite vow. He was not to cut his hair. Now, that's the part you see focused on in chapter 13. But a Nazarite was not to cut his hair ever. He was not to drink wine, touch grapes, eat anything of the vine, not even be around that and stay away from that. And he was also not to touch a dead body. So he was separated. His parents, God actually done it, but they got him started on the right path. And not only that, look at the verse number 25 says, And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times. God had touched Samson. Yeah, In spite of all that, do you read Samson sometimes and think, Boy, Samson, you missed it. 
Samson, you messed up. Samson, you had everything going for you. What went wrong? I find myself sometimes saying, Brother Justin, you had everything going for you. What went wrong? Right. And you waste the opportunities that the Lord's given us. Can I tell you, Calvary Baptist Church is a very unusual church. It's easy to fall into a rut if you come here every week. All you've got to do is get out and go somewhere else. And it won't take long. You will appreciate the moving of the Spirit of God at Calvary Baptist Church. Boy, I thank the Lord for a preacher that will stand up and tell right and take a stand and preach what's right. Doesn't back down. Doesn't worry about offending someone. Not set out to offend someone, but set out to preach the Word of God. Boy, see the Spirit move and save sinners. Boy, I don't want to take that for granted. Calvary has so much potential, but the danger is this. It's easy to walk through the doors, jump in a seat, and just come through and leave and never put in your part of the potential. Right, 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 right. Boy, I believe one time we're going, when we stand before the Lord, I believe part of what we'll answer for is what we didn't do. Right. What we could have done. Right. Do you know what God will never do? Why didn't no, never, ever, ever will, will God stand me and Brother Kimmer side by side and ask one of us why we didn't do what the other one should have done? Right. You know why? Because I'm not Brother Kimber. He's not Brother Woolage. I can't say he's not Brother Justin because he is. And I'm not going to have to answer for him. He won't answer for me. I might want to trade with him. But he might say, I've left a lot undone. You see, we've left a lot of potential that we could have done. And I believe you'll see that. I'm going to try to preach quickly this evening. Look with me in chapter number 14. <laughs> I want you to notice three things tonight about Samson. Three things that caused him to not meet up to his potential. Number one, Samson focused on the sensual. Yeah. Samson focused on the sensual, not the sinful. Sensual does not necessarily mean sinful. Sensual means it appeals to your senses. All of us are sensual. Don't think wicked, but all of us would rather eat a T-bone steak than a chicken McNugget. Amen. Amen. All of us would rather look out across a beautiful forest or a beautiful field of flowers than a toxic waste dump. We want things that appeal to our senses. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem comes when we let our senses rule us more than, the, more than what the Lord would have us to do. Look in chapter 14. Notice the first words of Samson. It says in chapter number 14, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Guess who Samson was not supposed to marry? One of the daughters right. of the Philistines. They were pagan women. They were not believers. It says in verse 2, And he came up and told his father and mother and said, Notice what the first things he says to his parents are. I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. What do you bet she was pretty? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Samson's appealed to the senses. He found a beautiful woman. He said, well, I don't care if she's a pagan. I'll win her over to our side. You ever heard a person say that? Boy, I've seen people. Well, I, I know they're lost, Brother Justin, but I'm still going to date them, and I'm still going to marry them because I'll win them over. And almost always, it goes the right. other way. Right. And they're out of church, and they're not living for God, and they can't take a stand for the Lord and because they made the wrong choice. But notice what happens in verse 3. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren? Notice how he said it. Is there never a woman? Sounds like this ain't the first time this has happened. Uh -huh. And it goes on to say, Or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me. Boy, talk about gimme, gimme pleasure. Just, I want her. Yeah. Notice what he says. For she pleaseth me well. Mm -hmm. You know what Samson was all about? Pleasure and self. Right. You're right. You're right. Isn't that us more often than not? Notice verse number 7. It says, and he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. You know what Samson's motto would have been? Me first. Yeah. Brother Heath and I were just talking about Brother Barry Rackley preached a message here years ago yeah. on me first. Isn't that us? We're all about us before somebody else. That was Samson. It's what I want. It's what I like. It's not about you. It's about me. It's about the money I want to spend. It's about the places I want to go. It's about what I want to do. And it's never about anyone else. Boy, that's Samson, if there ever was one. You know what his problem was? It was self. You know where self comes in? Pride. Amen. Samson pitches a big old party. You'll read about it in ch chapter number 14, verse 10. So his father went down. Notice when Samson went down, he drug somebody else with him. So his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast. 
For so used the young men to do. You know what the feast usually refers to in this? A big drunken party. Yeah. Verse 11. And it came to pass when they saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. He was all about being popular. Yeah. Do we not live in that day and age? Yes, if your only pictures on Instagram and Facebook are of yourself, you got a problem. <laughs> you know, some people, it's like selfie city. You know, I'm not against Instagram and Facebook if you don't lose it, use it like a knucklehead. Amen? Yep. It's a great tool. But some people, you ought to see the pictures. I remember selfie fails. A guy at work said, look at this. And he'd show people, you know, where they're tripping, trying to take a selfie and stuff like that. But you ought to see the girls, they take a selfie and they're all like... <laughs> Winking and doing their eyes. And I'm thinking, you are driving down the road and you're looking at your phone. You're going to kill everybody and you ain't going to look poochy faced then. Uh, then you got the guys, you know, that the selfie fails. They got the guy standing in front of the mirror. He's like, and I'm thinking, your arms ain't no bigger than mine. What are you doing? You know, if you got big cannons, I can see it. You got little spaghetti arms. What, what are you doing? It's all about sales. Well, we live in the self generation. We live in that day and age. It's all about me. It's all about look at my picture. Look at me. You ever notice why people post? You know why people usually, now you say, oh, you never do this. You lie like a dog. You know why most people post a picture of their self? So people will say, oh, you look so beautiful. Such a pretty girl. Such a handsome guy. Come on now. That's pride. Right. Now, some of you is going to go, he's been looking on my account. I don't even have it. I ain't looked at none of your accounts. Is it not true, though? If Samson would have had an iPhone, boy, he'd always be walking down the field going, Ch -ch 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 -ch. Boy, Samson, he'd have pictures of himself everywhere. He'd have some pretty girl going, Ch -ch, and he'd get one on this side. Ch -ch, that would be Samson. He's all about pride. He's all about self. You know why? He focused on whatever felt good. Do you know what you can't live life by? Yeah. Your feelings. Amen. Amen. Sometimes what feels good is going to lead you wrong. I was studying right about, about David and Ahithophel and different things this week, and I never noticed this before, never put it together this way. I was reading a writer, and he said, what was one of the reasons David fell with Bathsheba? He said, I believe one of the causes was this. He fell into the, 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 the plague of polygamy. He married a wife and another wife and another wife and another wife, and he downplayed relationships that God had sanctified. Right. So then he didn't, yes, he would honor his wife's, wife's was the problem, but he had got that out of skew because he said, I'm the king, I'll do what I want to do. And then when he saw another man's wife, he said, well, I've already kind of downplayed this. What's it matter to downplay another man's marriage? Why? David was all about self. Whatever, not all the time, David was a great man, but what's the one black eye on him? That right. event. And it brought a plague on him for the rest of his life that followed. It's all about the sensual. It's all about self. That's the story of Samson. It's all about being popular. It's all about, all about Samson. And if you're all about you, you're never going to live up to your potential. Right. Do you know why our bus workers do what they do? Because it's not all about them. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not about you when you get up on a 25 degree December morning and jump on a bus that takes till you get back here before the heat works good. It's not about you. It's not about you when it's 100 degrees when you walk out and jump on a bus in a July day. And you take off down the road and you've got kids that are ready to be off the bus. And they're bouncing off the walls. It's not about you. What's it about? It's about somebody else. Amen. You'll never live up to your potential if it's all about you. Right. Anytime we focus on ourselves... We're focusing on the wrong thing. Right. As you focus on Christ, we'll always notice the needs of others. Amen. You know when Jesus had compassion on other people, you know what he did? He just didn't say, oh, I feel sorry for you. Compassion moved him to action. Amen. Amen. The problem is we never look at others because we want to look at self. Not only did Samson focus on the sensual, he flirted with sin. So where do you see that? That's over in chapter number 16. There's a whole lot I'd like to give you here. But notice how the order happens. In chapter 14, Samson starts out sort of right. He's looking for a wife. He said, go get her for me for a wife. He started the right way, but he's looking in the wrong place. Right. Why? Because of his sensual nature. He wants what feels good to him. So he's flirting with sin there. He said, well, I'm going to do it the right way. I'm still going to get married, but I'm just going to marry the wrong woman. 
In chapter number 16, verse 1, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. What happened? He flirted with sin in chapter 14, and it gets him in trouble when it comes to chapter 16. Amen. Yeah. Let me show you something I never noticed. Look, if you read chapter 14, you read about Samson, the events of Timnath, the lion he kills, the riddle that he gives. You come to chapter 15, you read about his own men tying him up, and he kills the thousand with the jawbone of an ass. You read about how he carries the gate of the city up towards Hebron. You read about all that. You come to verse 20 in chapter 15. It says, And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. He did all those exploits. God moves on him three times in that passage in chapter 14 and chapter 15. Three times God specifically moves on him. And then he rules for 20 years. What happens? Verse 16. Then went Samson to Gaza. Apparently for 20 years, Samson had done pretty well. Yeah. We don't read about the good or the bad. Samson's judging. He's ruling over the people. Do you ever notice you never read about Samson building an altar? Right. You never read about Samson praying unless there was a selfish aspect twisted into it. You never read about Samson trying to be a minister and a blessing to the nation. It's all about Samson. And you know what he does? He says, I can handle this. I can go into the heart. It'll be all right. It's not a big deal. It's always a big deal when you get around the wrong things. Yeah. I read the story one time about a lady. She was in a pure white dress. And she was getting ready to go take a tour of a West Virginia coal mine. She looked at the man. She said, can I go in there wearing this? He said, yeah, but it won't come out looking like that. <laughs> you know what he understood? Coal mines are dusty, dirty right. places. And he said, you by nature of just getting around it are going to get it on you. Mm -hmm. You know what Samson thought? Samson thought, I can handle it. Right. Why? It was all about Samson. Right. Anytime you start thinking about what you can do and I can handle this and you rule the Lord out of it, you're headed for a bad Amen. Amen. Why? You've lost focus. Yes. And you've begun to focus on self. You can't flirt with sin and get by with it. I heard a preacher years ago give an illustration. He said, if right there where that box of Kleenexes was, was a rattlesnake. And I knew he had a five foot striking distance. He said, I'm not going to stand five foot two inches away. He might have a good day. Yeah. 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 I'm not going to stand close to him at all unless i got a garden hoe or a shovel in my hands. Amen? What happens this? People get too close and they think, I can handle it. Yes, sir. They Amen. can't handle it, but I can handle it. I right. can get around bad things and it won't bother me. Right. You know why people watch the things they do on TV? Because they say it won't bother me. Right. Right. I can watch the sodomites and I won't get softened over towards them. Yes, you ah, Right. You see it long enough, right. you'll accept it. Right. You can't watch murder and all this thing on TV and it never. And you say, oh, it won't bother me. You become hardened over to it. When it happens in real life, it doesn't affect you to see it on the news You're right. right. You're conditioned to sin. You're conditioned. You get used to it and you think, I can handle it. And slowly you get closer and closer and closer to it. And one sin like David, the sin of polygamy, led him to the sin of Bathsheba, which led him to the sin of killing Uriah, which leads him on further and further and further down a dangerous path. Why? He flirted with sin. Let's look at chapter number 16. He meets a beautiful woman in the valley of Sorek by the name of Delilah. If you were to ask people, say, who goes with Samson? Everybody says Delilah. Everybody knows the story. And you read about him, and the, the Philistine lords come and they say, entice him. Lure him in. It didn't take too much enticing, to be honest. Right. A pretty face, Samson was sold. I can handle it. No matter what it is. Fellas, you start flirting with some lady at work, you say, I can handle it. You can't handle it. Right. Lady, some guy at work comes up and he's always nice to you. You can't handle it. Yeah, you say so you may for a while, but slowly you're going to be conditioned and before long you're in trouble. Right. And you're down a dangerous path that you don't know how to get back out of. What's the best thing to do? Stay away from it. Amen. 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 So what happens? You all know the story. She comes and she says, oh, Samson, where's the source of your strength? You know what that tells me? Samson didn't look like some big Hercules guy. He didn't look strong. Or everybody would have said, look at him. You know why he's so strong. He's got big bulging muscles like Brother Justin. Kimber. <laughs> Brother, I like them drag you in with me. They didn't see that. Samson didn't look like a massive muscular man. He just looked like a normal guy. If he would have been a huge muscular guy that was, you know, seven foot tall and rippled with muscles, they'd have said, well, no wonder he's so strong. But they didn't see that. 
They didn't know where the source of his strength was. So they said, you get him to tell. Find out what it is. And she says, all right, I always enjoy telling. I've told this story several years in, in, to the children in Super Church, and they always seem to enjoy it because when you tell it, you say, she, she says, well, Samson, little Sam baby. And they all laugh. She <laughs> says, where, why are you so strong? What, what would make you weak? You did not notice what she says. I want you to see how prideful Samson really is. She says in verse 6, And Delilah said to Samson, this is chapter 16, verse 6, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. You know what she just said? How can I make you lose your strength so you could be afflicted? So we could punish you and torture you and hinder you? Well, the devil's not that subtle usually, That's is he? That's right. Except to the people that are prideful and say, Devil, yeah, you can't trip me up. That's good. He doesn't have to be subtle with you because you think I've got it. I can flirt at work. I can flirt on Facebook. I can do whatever I want to. I can, I can get around the potheads and the drunks and hang out with them and I'm going to be all right. It's only a matter of time before you're shipwrecked. Amen. If you think you can handle it, you're in trouble. Right. So what's he do? He says, bind me with seven green widths. Imagine thin little bowstrings, new like vines. She ties him up. Samson's, the Philistines be upon you. Ha! And he breaks loose and everybody runs out. Okay, don't, don't mess with him. He's, he's, he's still strong. Samson, you lied to me. You know what he does? He says, well, tie me up with new ropes. Samson, the Philistines be upon you. Ha! He breaks loose like an incredible hope. Where's that coming from? Samson, look, Samson, you, if you love me, boy, isn't that what women always do to him? <laughs> if you love me, his, the woman in Timnath did the same thing to him. Said, if you really love me, you would do this for me. Young people, if some boy says, if you really love me, you say, well, I don't. Give me the trail, Joker. <laughs> if he tells you that, he doesn't love you. He's right. just lustful. Send him back there. Right. See what happened? She says, well, if you'll take the seven locks of hair, it would sound like his hair was in like big braids. He's never cut it. And then he'd weave it up into the beam. Samson, the Philistines be upon you. Ah, he jumps up and always still in strength. And you know what it says she does? She stays after him. Let me flip a page. I want you to see what it says. Over in verse number 16. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily. You know what the devil's going to do with you? You're prideful and you think you can handle it? He's just going to keep putting yes, the pressure. Sir, right. You're right, brother. They say there's a torture that they would use in China, especially in different places. They said, if I was being tortured, I'd tell everything I know. I said, what you want me to make up? I'll tell it to you. I'll tell you anything you want me to tell you. They take a drop of water and let it just hit you in the forehead. You say, well, that wouldn't bother me. Yeah, let it do that for about three hours straight and see what you think. It'd probably hit me and I'd be going, oh, it went my eye. Oh, it went my eye. And they'd be going, get him out of here. You know why it wears on you? It just slowly, after time, after time, after time, and finally it breaks people down. It doesn't take a big thing, just a slow, little, persistent drop. And that's the way the devil does. What's he do? He tells it all. If you cut my hair, I'll lose it all. And that's exactly what happened. He thought he could handle it. Let me show you the last thing real quickly. He focused on the sensual, not necessarily the sinful. He focused on things of that appeal to his flesh. Not sinful things, just appeal for appealing things. Then he flirted with sin, and finally he failed in his separation. There were three things a Nazarite could not do. Number one, he was not to touch a dead body. He was not to contaminate himself. Warren Wearsby in his commentary says in chapter 14, when he goes back to the lion with honey, a lion was an unclean animal. It was not to be eaten. And when he contaminated himself going in the honey, he broke that. But he also would have touched a dead body in the process of killing all of those Philistines. Mm -hmm. He's lost one aspect of his, of his separation. And you know what that's a great picture of? Staying away from the dead things? Staying away from the dead things. Yeah. Staying away from the things of this world. Amen. God doesn't want you around the things of this world. Not only that, he also was not supposed to, to drink. He was supposed to not eat grapes, drink strong, strong, strong wine, vinegar of wine, eat raisins, anything to do with it. Where do you see him in chapter 14? Down in a vineyard. Boy, does Samson know how to pick the places to go. Yeah. Then he throws the big party in chapter 14, verse number 10 and 11. Most commentators seem to believe it's a drunken party. Samson's falling again. What's that a great picture of? The things that you should be taking on the inside and you should not take on the inside. Amen. 
The average Christian, you know why you can't live up to the potential God's got for you? You know why you've wasted some potential? Why I've wasted potential? We're too busy pumping junk in right. instead of the right Amen. things in the scripture in. And then we can, we're not ready to serve the Lord when he's ready to use Amen. us. Amen. The third aspect was his hair. That was his appearance. Everybody could look at Samson and know he was a Nazarite just by looking at him. You can look and say, oh, there's a Nazarite. How do you know? Look at his hair. What do you mean you can't tell? Look at him. He's a Nazarite. Nobody else has hair like that. Look at that stuff. Look how long it is. And just by looks, you could tell the difference. I remember, did anybody here know Brother Gil Massengill? Anybody ever heard him preach? He was a wild man. A wild does not even describe it. He was all over the place. Y'all know I grew up in a Methodist church. My youth leader would get preachers to come preach to us. They didn't come to the Sunday morning Methodist service. Not a one of them would have came. He had Brother Gil Massengill preach. Brother Gill was like, and I don't mean this disrespectful. Y'all ever seen like a mouse in one of those wheels running around? That's the way Brother Gil Massengill preached. He was all over the place. He would be jumping all over things, running across the communion table. Flowers are falling. Offering plates are flipping. Man, he was wild. A bunch of Methodist boys, we were going. <laughs> I got an answer to call to preach on Brother Massengill. So I'm not throwing off on him. I love Brother Massengill. Man, he was a preacher. He was a wild man. And he came, Brother Kevin, our youth leader, said, hey, i got a man going to come preach on separation. We said, what's that? He said, how you ought to live? We said, what do you mean, how you ought to live? I never heard anything on separation, how you ought to live and what you should and shouldn't do. I didn't have a clue what that was. When he <laughs> left, I knew what it was. <laughs> I thought that man had lost his mind. <laughs> In the Methodist church, you come as you are, leave as you were, dress however you want to. I never heard nobody preach on how you ought to dress. Boy, did I ever that day. He said, he used to preach like this right here. He'd run all over the place. He said, bless God, God, cover up your neck and he'd be running around. I was standing like this. I'm glad I wore long pants that day is all I had to say. He said, I'll tell you one thing. He said, the priest over in Exodus chapter number 28, he was a wild man. He said, they had to wear linen riches. God said, cover up your thighs. If I can see your thighs, I see nakedness according to God. I went, I ain't lying. This is what I did. I thought, he's lying. I looked it up and I said, well, that's what it said. I did. Man, he was wild. I never heard preaching on dress. He told, he'd tell us, he said, I'll tell you what, you young people, one thing, you get up in the choir, if you've got to cross your legs and keep from showing your undies, you ain't dressed right on it. <laughs> I'm telling you what he said. He preached, he said, you don't even get around drunks. You get around drunks, you're going to be a drunk. And he was like, but he did it with a smile the whole time. Right. You know why? Because he loved us. And was trying to keep us out of trouble. He said, you ought to dress like a Christian. You ought to walk like a Christian. You ought to talk like a Christian. You ought to act like a Christian. You ought to be different from the world. Amen. I never heard that. Now how that manifests itself in your life is between you and the Lord. But I've never heard that you ought to be different than the world. I didn't have a clue. You know what Samson's hair did? It made him look different. Ladies, that don't mean you got to wear a bonnet and a dress that drags the floor and has a 10-foot train. That's not what that means. Fellas, that don't mean you have to wear a shirt and tie when you go to work every day. If you work at a bank, it might be a good idea. But other than that, you don't have to do that. It just meant God wanted us to be different. Yes, amen. Just like Samson. I told my wife, I was preaching at the tent the other week, and I said, I said, I want people if they see me. And somebody, if I were to see one of you young people in Walmart, you were to see me and I didn't see you, and I'm walking through Walmart, and you were with a friend that didn't come to church, if you were to look and say, hey, there's Brother Justin, and your friend said, who's that? Brother, is that your brother? Well, in the Lord, but yeah, that's Brother Justin. And you said, well, who's that? Well, he's a preacher in our church. I wouldn't want him going, he's a preacher? I don't want that. I'm beyond trying to look trendy. I told him at the tent meeting, I'm going to be 40 this month. It's time for me just to dress goofy and embarrass my kids. Amen? <laughs> you know, that's what it's time to do now. It's not about being cool. Right. You think Paul right. tried to dress cool? Right. Right. Paul just covered up and preached. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't about fashion to Paul. That don't mean you have to dress homely and ugly. You can be fashionable. But Paul's focus wasn't on drawing attention to this. Right. He wanted to draw attention to the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The things Paul said, he wanted to be different. He didn't want to tell the same jokes. He wanted to be different. But notice what Samson did when he lost one aspect of his separation. God still was willing to touch him. You know God still will draw a straight line with a crooked stick? Amen. Amen. That's good. Then he loses another aspect of his separation. 
And God still moved on him and used him again. But do you know after this happened, you don't read the spirit of the Lord coming on him anymore? Right. He was completely, he had completely lost all of his difference from the world. All three aspects of his vow were broken. And he was just like everybody else. You know what they did? Yeah. They take him and they blind him. The very thing that got him in trouble in chapter number 14, he's now lost his eyesight mm -hmm. when he saw the woman in Timnath. They take him, they blind him, and then they bind him, and then they put him to grinding. You know sin has blinding, grinding, and binding effects in your life? Yes. Amen. Amen. Samson ends up in one suicidal last act when he pushes the pillars over. And we all remember it because he killed a great number of the Philistines. God still used him in the very end. But what was starting to come back at the very end? Now I want to show you why that matters and we're done. If you look in chapter number 13, when you go to chapter number 13, what you see is one aspect of this was focused on Samson. Just one thing. Let me find it here. Only one thing that you see that's sincerely focused on. Let's see. It says, um, I'm looking for a verse of verse 13, and it says that a razor shall not come upon his head. If you see it, holler it. Verse 5. Verse 5. For lo, thou shalt conceive. And bear a son. Now notice, he's going to be a Nazarite. Notice where the focus is. And no razor shall come on his head. For thou shalt be a Nazarite, or for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. You know what they didn't? He's supposed to be a Nazarite. That's more than just his hair. That involves touching dead bodies and drinking wine as well. And grapes and raisins and all of those things. But we don't read that. You know why I believe that is? You know what I believe Samson focused on? The outward. As long as I look the part, it don't matter what's going on on the right. inside. Yeah. You know why a lot of people never live up to their potential for God? Because you'll dress like you're ready for church. Right. You'll grab a King James Bible. You'll huh. walk in. Amen. You'll smile in service. You'll shake the preacher's hand and you enjoy being here. But the outside's looking pretty good. But the inside. Right. Right. Amen. Right. Right. Amen. Samson focused on the wrong thing. Why? He lost the things nobody could see before he lost what everybody could see. Amen. Do you know what you're going to lose first? Probably not your outward appearance. If your outward appearance falls apart for God, it's because your insides have already been left behind right. with God. Amen. Don't fall behind with God. Amen. It's more than clothes, it's a heart. Amen. It's a heart to win sinners. Amen. It's a heart to feel for sinners that our lives are in a mess. It's a heart. I had a man come to me at camp. And he said, hey, would you help me pray for my son? He's in a mess. I said, man, I'd love to pray for him. And I know who he is. I said, yes, I will. You know why? Because it's more than an outward appearance. That's right. It's a heart. You get your heart right with God. God can use you. Amen. You'll walk into a store. You ever walked into a store? I'll end with this. Let's stand to our feet. You ever walked into a store before? And you see maybe somebody behind the cash register, and boy, there you can just tell by looking at them, their life's in a pretty bad place. If you're right with God when you walk in, you say, man, their life's in a pretty bad place. And you're burdened, and you feel for them, whether they're saved, maybe they've just gotten saved, or maybe they're way away from God, or maybe they're just lost. But you're burdened. But if your heart's not there, you walk in and you go, boy, they're a mess. Boy, aren't you glad God looked past the mess? Yes. Amen. 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 Aren't you glad God gives second and third and fourth and fifth yes. and sixth and Amen. seventh and eighth chances? God could use you to do something huge. You know what Calvary needs? People that are willing to do it. Yeah. Not wait on the preacher to say, we're going to have something we're going to do and I want you to be involved. Don't wait on the announcement. Just go get involved somewhere. Amen. You know, Brother John could use every Saturday morning. Somebody go knock on some doors. Amen. Try to get some more kids on the bus. You don't have to wait for an invitation. I just gave it to you. You know what Miss Janet could use? You know what? Uh, the other routes. Let's see, bus the other route, whatever bus it is. Bus five. You know what the Dursums could use? Somebody just to do that. Somebody just to get involved. Live up to your potential. Amen. Can I tell you the greatest potential is what everybody doesn't see. Right. It's what you do for the Lord Amen. and nobody else. Amen. The altar is open. If you need to come this evening, 
why don't you just come say, God, help me to give it all. Boy, I'm so guilty of being a Samson. Give part of it. Let the, let the Lord touch in an area, but don't just dump it all out for God. Well, God wants it all. What can God do? What if you just said, God, here it is. Where could God take you? Brother Matt Allen's dad said one time, he said, Brother John Allen said, what if you could not fail in whatever you tried for God? What would you try? He said, go try it. What if you knew you were going to try something for the Lord? And you said, I want to go win that sinner. And you knew you would have success. He said, try it. You know why? If your heart's in it, God may give you the success. If you don't get the success, God still gave you the experience. Boy, go for it. What could you do for God? Who's at your workplace that's lost? They don't need Samson coming in. They need a Paul coming in. Who is it you can reach? Who is it you can make an impact on? Oh, God can use you so <coughs> God can use you huge. Why these pray do you need to go? leaving the church Saturday, 2 o'clock. Uh, if you want to go to the youth meeting, please sign up. That way they have an idea of how many they've got going. Uh, be leaving at 2 o'clock. You'll get home by at least midnight. So um, I don't know how long it'll take to get there, how long service will go, but you just go and pray. Boy, Calvary's, the potential is unbelievable. You know why? It's a bunch of saved sinners. And if you're saved, God can use you. You don't have to be somebody famous. God used old tent maker. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So let's go do something for the Lord. We're going to pray and be dismissed. Please stop by and sign up. There's several sign-up sheets. Get your name on the list and go home living for the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for allowing us to be here. God, I thank you for an open door, a privilege to stay in. God, help us to meet the potential you've given. God, all of us that are saved by the grace of God, with the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us, God, there's so much potential that you could do through our lives. God, let us not be prideful or boastful. 
God, let us just be willing vessels. God, I pray that you'd help touch my preacher as he's away yeah. this week. God, I pray that you'd give him rest. I pray that you'd give him health and strength. God, I pray you'd touch him as he preaches. Use that meeting, I pray. God, I pray for him as he preached in the youth meeting on Saturday. God, I pray that you'd touch there. Yeah. God, stir the hearts of our young people. God, I thank you for their excitement. God, I pray that it kindle a fire in the hearts of others. Father, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.